right now. If you're a single woman, you're homeless, you and you got kids, you're probably going to have to keep calling that number until something opens up. That, that myth is, is, is really not correct. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, uh, how many beds do we have locally for homeless people? Uh, really, it's best to kind of split it up. But if you look at single men, we probably have a, right around 275, or we'll say 250 beds total. Uh, if we look at families, we're again at about a couple hundred beds. So all, all said, 400 to 500 beds total spread out throughout the city. And contrary to popular belief, most of those beds are not in Over the Rhine. Wow. So when you look at it, so we don't have a large capacity for homeless people on the streets. No, this is what is scary about it. Uh, we, we know typically that folks, before they hit the shelter system or they hit the bridges, they first do the couch surfing. They exhaust those resources first. In 2008, when the economy tanked, a lot of people started couch surfing, probably a big bulk of people all about the same time. If the economy doesn't pick itself back up, those folks might hit our shelter system all about the same time, and we don't have room. Wow. That is scary. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a tremendously scary thought. What about in the winter? What happens now that it's getting cold, 25, 30 degrees at night, 40 degrees, mm -hmm. high during the day? I mean, what, what happens in the winter? What do we see the trends given the fact yeah. that we have four climates and yeah. four seasons in Cincinnati? Every, every, every single night in Cincinnati, there are folks that sleep outside for a host of reasons. Some people just can't take shelter life. Some people have something on their record that doesn't allow them into a certain shelter. Whatever reason, folks are outside. Right now, we have more people outside than ever before. Maybe even in the numbers of a couple hundred people sleeping outside. We don't all know where they, you know, average folk don't know where they are, but they're there. In the winter, historically for the past 13 or so years, the city has opened up a cold shelter at the Over the Rhine uh, Recreation Center. But up until two years ago, it only opened at below zero degrees. Below zero. Two years ago, it started opening at below 10. Last year, we almost lost it entirely because city council has actually never budgeted for this shelter. It has always come out of excess dollars from the Recreation Commission, which is illogical to begin with, and the Rec Commission didn't have the money last year. This year, we're actually starting a collaboration, believe it or not, where we're bringing service providers together with the city folk to say, how can we bring public and private dollars to this to get it open a few more nights this year? With the goal of next year, we want it in a better facility with trained staff opened every night of the winter. Because mm -hmm. the fact is, there were nights last year, 12 degrees, foot of snow on the ground, folks were outside. There was no option to come inside for them. And at that point, the shelters are full. It is a bad scenario. That's when you start losing appendages. That's when you start losing lives. So when we think about what we see, and I think that many of us may think that the people that we see on the highways, mm -hmm. people that we see that are on in Washington Park, mm -hmm. in the over the Rhine, in the downtown area, are they all homeless, on the street homeless? Or are many of those couch surfing? Or are many of those in abandoned buildings? And do they just come out during the day or come out during events? Mm -hmm. uh, those individuals that we see. But are they, are they going back to some housing structure? Right. Uh, most, most folks that are homeless that, that you see, um, you know, and it's kind of edging on the question of panhandling and things like that, people yeah. standing at the, at the highway. Uh, most of those folks are not fitting, fitting the mentality of everybody who is homeless. Um, most folks who are homeless are not panhandling, they're not standing on the corner, they're actually out. We estimate that 60% of men who are homeless in Cincinnati work either part-time or full-time. Mm -hmm. They just don't make enough money to afford housing. If you go to the drop-in center, in the middle of the day, that place is nigh on to empty. If you walk over the Rhine, walk the downtown, you're gonna run into a few people, but you're not gonna run into the 12,000 to 15,000 people that are homeless every night. Most of them are out and working. They're out and getting business done. Um, so it's kinda like sometimes the greasy wheel gets the attention. And Absolutely. that's really what happens at a government level. At, you know, we focus on the 16 people that are panhandling in yeah. our neighborhood. Because it's the same people. I mean, when I go downtown, it, it's not a lot of 
new faces. Right. I mean, most of the people that have been down there are been down there for years. Mm -hmm. Panhandling. There's one guy over in Covington. I mean, he's been panhandling for at least 174 years. Right. I mean, right at the speedway. I mean, he mm -hmm. kind of walks around, and I mean, he hasn't even aged. He looked 100 when he was 20, and he still looks 100, and he might be 100, mm -hmm. but he's the same person. So right. I think that sometimes when you see that, I mean, that expectation. Now we have on Pete Roseway. It mm -hmm. seems like that's the new Washington Park. Mm -hmm. When you look at night down on Pete Roseway, people are sleeping on the benches. I've seen a lot of people sleeping down there, uh, and but I think that you know then you know, people sleeping under bridges, mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that you're right when we see that those are just that those small numbers of, of people that we see, and there's actually a lot more. When we think about the panhandling, right. and 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 in Cincinnati, that's gotten a lot of press mm -hmm. over the years. They had to register. Mm -hmm. Uh, they had to get IDs. You had mm -hmm. to be a certified, licensed panhandler. Mm -hmm. uh, what, was, what were the thoughts of the position in uh, the Greater Cincinnati Coalition for the Homeless in looking at that whole concept of registering to panhandle? Right. Yeah. For a good number of years, you had to have a license. You had to pay for it. If not, you get arrested, ticketed, whatever. And the coalition was adamantly against this. And... Uh, and took it on. Uh, people who were homeless, people who panhandled, uh, sued the city. Uh, Jennifer Kinsley, a lawyer that we still work with, uh, led them in that suit. And we triumphed. It went all the way to the Supreme Court level. Uh, we settled with the city. That law went away. Uh, it was deemed unconstitutional. That was the argument the whole time. Uh, you may hate what I have to say, and I may hate what you have to say, but I have a right to say it. It doesn't matter. And uh, you can't charge people a fee. You can't ha make people get a license to talk, to ask a question. Um, and so that, that was the base of the argument. That went away, but, but it's continued since then. There's it's coming every back. now and then, there's more and more challenges to it, uh, particularly from Jeff Birding on council. He, he, he really doesn't like panhandling. And it's coming back. Uh, I think that I just recently saw something where they're talking about with, the, with certainly with the casinos, with the development of the uh, downtown and over the Rhine community, mm -hmm. with 3CDC mm -hmm. climbing up, Uptown Consortium climbing down, coming down the hill. Uh, now they're talking about that you're not going to be able to ask at ATMs in front of mm -hmm. uh, venues, Paul Brown Stadium, uh, when concerts are letting off, Aronoff Center. And so now they're creating again a set of rules. Mm -hmm. Now, is that outside of the process and the victory that you? Uh, see for homeless people, the panhandlers, uh, from the from the de that decision within the settlement from several years back, and, and with out of that turmoil came came a couple pages of law. Some of those law were uh, that you couldn't ask by an ATM, you couldn't ask somebody in a forceful manner. You know, basically, you couldn't assault somebody when you were panhandling. Give me some money. You can't I'm sorry. That. Can I have some money? Right. You can't overly frighten somebody into making ah, and into forcing them to do it. And, uh, you know, so laws like that, you know, we back. agree with that. We okay. agree. We don't, okay. want, we don't want folks feeling like they're getting robbed. Yeah, exactly. You know? But, you know, when it goes too far to say, you know, when we get to the point where we say, well, you can't panhandle in front of a gas station. You can't panhandle, you know, at some point you're just belittling the law. Yeah. You're just adding your own stuff in. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, what you're doing is you're creating, you're circumventing what your process and agreement was, and you know how to circumvent it. So you yes. can create enough uh, exigent or extinctual mm -hmm. or all these other laws that don't address this, but really do address it. Right. Uh, so that's, uh, that, that's always interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think that... Uh, when we look at our city, uh, now I think that you know part of the challenges is when we look at it is, you know, what is the responsibility of a city mm -hmm. uh, to try and create an environment uh, that is a thriving city? Do you see that there is a <coughs> contradiction between a thriving city and these issues around homelessness and panhandling? Do you mm -hmm. see that being a contradiction of saying that we can't? Can we have both, or can they occupy the same space? You know, I think we got to look at, we got to check our mentality. Right now, all this panhandling stuff or the talk of, hey, the drop-in center's got to move or mm -hmm. Washington Park has to be completely redone, all this stuff is like saying, well, we're not going to do anything about fixing homelessness or poverty. We're just going to move it to the margins. We're just, we mm -hmm. don't want to see it. 
And if we don't see it, then rich white folk will come in, move in, they'll buy their condos, and we'll get the economy going again. We, you know, we've got to check that because the fact is, we're probably, you know, this is a moral thing, but economically we're probably not going to make it if, if all of us aren't going up the ladder a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're not helping people, the lower class, the middle class, you know, that's where we've got to put our focus on. This idea of bringing people in that can afford these expensive condos, uh, it's just, it's, it's going right back to Reagan's theory. In a microcosm, we're repeating what Reagan did 25 mm -hmm. years ago in this city. So... Our response should be, and, and I don't know, are they, have they officially created a site or found a site for the drop-in center? I mean, is that in process of them relocating the drop-in center? Is it going to Queensgate? Where's it going? Mm -hmm. uh, 3CDC and city folks are, are they're kind of putting out their different sites for the drop to consider. The drop-in center's board has not said yes. They've not said no. So there is... You know, there is no big offer on the table. That was kind of the misconception that the media gave us, was that 3CDC was coming with all these private bucks and these wonderful sites for it, and, you know, here's this sweet deal, are you going to take it? No, that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of get up out and, you know, we'll kind of help you if you do. And, and one of the opportunities and challenges is, is that where it's located right now, around the corner from where we are, right. it's just so centrally located. That's right. And and then and then quite frankly, having Washington Park is just a comfortable place and a comfortable environment if you are homeless. Even if you're part of that mm -hmm. part time or full time working mm -hmm. homeless people, mm -hmm. that those are for them safe environments for them to be able to congregate and they're convenient. Mm -hmm. uh, they're in the crossroads of where people are. They're in crossroads of where services are, mm -hmm. service delivery is. Mm -hmm. And so it seems to me that if you put it on the periphery of a city or if you move it out, that now the reality is is that you're not going to have people that can get to the shelter. That's right. So similar to Mount Airy's shelter, right. where it's a challenge for many people to get to that shelter, mm -hmm. and they have to be bused to the shelter, mm -hmm. that now you're going to have now additional resources that it's going to take to get people to a shelter mm -hmm. that you've moved out of a centrally mm -hmm. located facility right uh, and so I think about that the people that is it CC's pizza that comes down to Washington Park in the vans that um, feeds people on weekends? I don't know if it's CC's different some, sometimes the different restaurants. religious groups different okay. organizations do come down to Washington Park because I know I did say it's CC's pizza out there I think one be, yeah. maybe a couple of Saturdays but uh, you know certainly I think that in our community that there's you know a lot of it uh, what's going on with Washington Park mm -hmm. uh, Washington Park yeah, obviously is the biggest park in this neighborhood. This mm -hmm. neighborhood is a concrete brick neighborhood. It's, uh, it's an extremely well used park and it's, well, it's used by people who are housed, people who are homeless. You know, all of us use this park. And 3CDC has decided, they decided several years back that they wanted to redo the park. Uh, they plan to spend $47 million on this two square block park. And they plan, they, I don't know if you guys remember, but there used to be Washington Park Elementary at the yes. north end of the park. About the time that 3CDC got involved, suddenly that building came down. That was our highest academic performing school in this neighborhood, too. Torn down, not rebuilt. And now that's going to be an underground parking garage owned by 3CDC. They are going to own a portion of our public land. Uh, they are a private company they will make money off of this. Uh, and <clears throat> they plan to, in this process, at some point there will be a fence around the entirety of the park. They will close down the park, will close down the sidewalks. Nobody will be in there. And I remember probably three years back sitting in meetings talking about the park. And a high-ranking police official at these meetings, these meetings were run by 3CDC, saying, we need to just put up a fence around this whole park. When we take it down, the folks that are there now won't be there anymore. And that's what they're doing. This is, this is an effort to get rid of people who use the park now. We have, for the past several months, pushed them and said, hey, if you're redoing the park, you need to stagger the construction. You need to provide an alternative site so that, not, so that we don't lose the park in its entirety for X number of months. People use it. And they consistently put us off, put us off. And just last week, they said, no, we're going to shut it down entirely for a period of an unknown period.